Real estate is a stock. You can't sit there and tell me, well, I wish I would have got X. Well, let me, this is what I tell people. When somebody says, well, I wish I would have got X price. I'm like, okay, well, you didn't sell at that time, right? It's the same thing I tell people now. It's like, I wish I would have bought Apple stock in the late 80s, okay? I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be sitting here doing this if I, if I bought you know, a bunch of Apple stock in the late 80s, but I can't do that. I can't get that price anymore. I have to pay today's price, and today's price is what you're going to get. So when you're thinking about prepping your property to sell in 2023, you got to make sure that you prep your property in time to get to the best market. This is Laracy Live, and I'm your host, Matt Laracy, giving you unfiltered access to the world of real estate. We cover market trends, news, and give you the honest answers that will keep you ahead of the real estate game. Okay, so today we are talking about how to prep your property to sell in 2023. We are coming to the end of the year, and as we get to the end of the year, people start thinking to themselves, well... What am I going to do next year? And one of those big things is I'm going to sell. And what are the steps we have to do in order to sell and have a successful sale in 2023? We're going to answer today. So first question is, what major trends should sellers be prepared for in 2023? You should be prepared for a slower market. The market overall is going to be much different than it was the previous year. In most parts of the market, we're going to see a little bit of a change. So the there's going to be pretty much two different types of markets going on. You're going to have the outskirts, like a Park Lakeview, you know, North Center, Wicker Buck, et cetera. Those places are going to be a slower market than they were the year before. They had really low inventory. We didn't have record low inventory, but we had low inventory and high demand. I think we're going to see lower inventory, not like low, low, but like lower, let's call it like two to three months in the beginning of the year. Um, so it's going to be a good market. It's just not going to be an insane market like we saw at the start of last year. Okay. Now, the heart of the city, though, is going to be something to watch. If you're a seller prepping to sell, I think you should know that the market will be better than it was the year before. So if you're in a high rise and something in the heart of the city, I think the market's going to be better solely because inventory levels are going to be lower. Now, you get 4.9 months of inventory as of today as we head into uh, 2023, which is the lowest amount of inventory we've seen in high rises since 2019. So that's a, that's a great thing to watch. And I'm not saying that it's going to be a gangbuster uh, year for high rises, but I definitely think it's going to be much better than it was the year before. Uh, what will be the best time to list in 2023? Mid-January to the end of April. Mid-January and April. You're going to see totally different markets starting in May, June, July. It'll be more of like a kind of like a semi-seller's market. August, September will be balanced at buyer's market, and then the rest of the year will be a hardcore seller's mar uh, hardcore buyer's market. So first quarter and a half are always the best months to sell. That's when the highest amount of demand is, Okay. And that's because uh, of the rental season uh, or, yeah, the rental cycle. Uh, will the busy season be similar to last year? Yes. You know, just like we mentioned, we're tied to these rental cycles. Leases are due end of March, April, May, first part of June. People come back from holiday. They want to buy or they come back from holiday and the buildings say like, hey, we need to know if you're staying or renting. And they have to make a decision to uh, buy or rent. And at that point, uh, inventory is still like lower than it will be because the average consumer that's selling thinks the best time on the list is March and April when really the first two months are your best months to get on the market because you have the least amount of competition. Now, rents are 25% higher than history right now. They're probably going to bump up another 10% next year. That's just what I think is going to happen due to inflation and taxes. Uh, and I think that's going to push a lot of people into the buyer's market. Yes, I know the rates are high. Yes, I know the market's not going to be as good. But I still think we're going to have the best months of the year in the first four to five months. Um, how can sellers prep now for the listing in the new year? Um, you know, I would say that, you know, hire somebody. Get the hiring out now. If you want to listen January, February, do it now. Start hiring everybody now. This is what we're doing. We're meeting with people now. We're doing a prep prop walkthrough. Okay. I'm sorry, a property prep walkthrough. Uh, we're going to go there and kind of tell you what we need, uh, what we think needs to be done to your place. Then we're doing all the marketing. Then we have everything. We're just sitting on it until after the first year and we're flipping it to sale. That's it. Get a good strategy in place. The worst thing is like, and this is what's going to happen is everybody's going to start interviewing after the first of the year. Uh, and then they're going to be late to the game a little bit. They probably could have got more because they were done first off the gate. But regardless, I mean, still, if you could still do it in January, February, it's going to be better than listening to March and April. Once you list for the best chance of multiple bids, mid-January to then April. That's it. Mid-January and April. Now, guys, this is general classification, okay? So, you know, you may have a different type of product and you're like, hey, Matt, you told me this was the best time in your podcast and it didn't happen. Again, it's property-specific Everything is specific, but in the markets we work, 
generally speaking, to target all the stuff, it's there. If I get a single family home, mid January is not usually the best. It's a little bit later. Same with duplex down, it's a little bit better if it's a bigger one, like above a million bucks. But if you're in that entry level one, I still think mid January to end of August, uh, end of April. Um, what are the most important ways to prep your home for putting it on the market? Make sure you get all your stuff done with now. I mean, obviously, you got to have your place decluttered and it has to look well. Uh, which, if you're a seller uh, and you live there, it sucks. If you're a seller and you live there and you got kids, it's a nightmare. So you can't really do anything right now because you know you get two minutes later, the whole place could look like a bomb went off in there. But you know, the main thing you do is get upgrades done. You know, maybe you got a lot of the kids scratch up the walls, so you got to paint the place. Uh, or maybe like the cabinets look really bad, so you want to paint them, or it's really dated, so you want to remodel maybe a bathroom. That's why, like, right now is good to do with this stuff. And guess what? Labor's cheaper during the holidays. Okay, so like when this is being shot, this is during holiday season. Like, they don't have as much business because a lot of people don't want to remodel during the holidays because they got people coming over. So think about that. So, like, this is when you should be doing. So when you think about, like, what, what else can I do to get my place ready, get all the stuff done with now so all you're doing is waiting to go live. Uh, what are the most important ways to prep your home? Uh, well, we just answer that. Is it worth doing minor updates before selling? In certain cases, yes. You know, uh, painting a cabinet can go a long way. Putting in a backsplash go a long way. You know, sometimes refinishing your floors if they're cherry. There's a lot of small stuff you could do. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get dollar for dollar back, but maybe it's a, a reason why it sells faster. I, I, I'm not saying this is the case for it. There's some places where it's like, okay, well, if you painted the cabinets, it wouldn't match the granite. So then we'd have to replace the granite, which then means we have to replace the, you know, backsplash, and then we have to refinish the floors. And now it's like a rehab. Now, sometimes I may say that's not worth it, or, you know, maybe I will get you more money back. But I'd say in general, minor updates – help uh but the best thing to do with that is consult uh your trusted advisor uh to walk you through it and you know that's a big thing we do is we, we tell you what we think needs to be done and we also uh have a property prep walkthrough to kind of make sure that uh maybe i didn't miss something that's why i you know i don't have like a, an eagle in this sense like i walk through the place i'm like here's what i think and i have my guy that walks through the place who knows better than i can of being like hey this you know you're an idiot you should have thought of this i'm like okay great like, I don't care. Like, I'm not, I'm not one to be like, I have to know everything in the world. I have a great team. So I got people who are better than me at certain things. So I hire them and they'll go do it. And that's what you should do. Hire somebody who's got a great team that can, like, make sure that this is a, a not only a super easy pro, uh, process for you, but also make sure that you don't miss anything. Will sure, certain neighbors be harder than others? I, I'm going to go on a limb here. Uh, th I'm probably going to be wrong. But maybe it's more my heart that, that's speaking more than my brain. But I think the downtown markets will perform better than they have in the past. I don't think they'll be as hot. They will not be as hot as the outskirts, but I think it's going to be closer this year. And that's why I'm going to say that's hotter because the heart of the city has been like such a terrible shit market for so long that it almost feels like weird that we're getting showings. In the last couple of months, most of our activity has been in the downtown markets. And guess what it is, guys? I know this sounds crazy, but it's people going back to work. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of that market pick up while at the same time, my showings have taken a nosedive in the outskirts. So I, I still think that the outskirts will probably do better, but I think it's going to be hotter. And, and, and I should mention one neighborhood that I think might make a big comeback is the West Loop. You know, the West Loop was like the hottest neighborhood in Chicago. In fact, it was named, I think, the hottest neighborhood. I think it was by Forbes or something like that. Uh, a couple of years back, everybody wanted to live there. It was tacky. It was sexy. It was fun. It had the best restaurants. It was amazing. Everything you put on there would sell in a day. Like, you wouldn't even have to list this shit. you get 50 offers on it. Then all of a sudden, the pandemic hit, and every tech guy was like, yo, bro, I'm moving to Idaho, and like I'm never going back to the office. So the West Loop like, took a nosedive. Now what I'm seeing is all these tech guys are getting called back to the office. Don't believe me, guys? See what's happened to Twitter, Meta, Amazon, you know, all the, you know, the FTX guys, what's going on with the NFTs, all these businesses getting demolished, and now these people are going to have to go back to the office, and guess where they're going back to? Guess where most of the tech offices exist? A lot of them exist in the West Loop. And now I'm seeing a lot of young guys get relocated to go back to the office and look where they're looking, the West Loop. So let's put that down. That's, let's make that as our prediction for hottest neighborhood. I think the West Loop, I'm going to go on a limb. I think the West Loop's going to be the hottest neighborhood in 2023. That's a big risk. That's like, that's like picking Saudi Arabia over Argentina in the World Cup, okay? Like, I think that's how crazy this is going into this year, but that's my prediction I'm going to do. But we're going to put that down, see if I'm right. 
Um, <clears throat> what major date should sellers know for next year? Mid-January and April. I'm telling you right now, end of April, the market's going to dive. It, happened, it happens every single year. I live in Groundhog Day. You know, I've been doing this license since 2006. Since I was two years old, I used to do this at my dad's office. I used to fill out the real estate books, okay? They used to have books. I'd fill them out, and people come and be like, hey, what's the new listings? I'm like, here's the book, okay? Uh, so I see these cycles, and every year, May hits, and the market kind of changes a little bit, okay? It's not like it's bad. It's just like it's not as good. And then June 1st hits, and everybody's like, hey, hey, you slow? You slow? It's like this. It's like this unwritten rule for some reason. It fucking drives me crazy. Every time I meet any agent, the first thing they say, "You busy? You busy?" They're like, they're like aggressive. I'm like, "Whoa, back up! All right, like just settle down. Like we're always busy." But a big thing that happens is all of a sudden, like first week of June, end of May, first week of June hits, and every agent, you know, like you're waiting on your client. First thing they say, "Hey, hey, hey!" And they like look around, like, "Hey, you been busy, dude? Like it's it's slow down, right? Slow down, right? Is it different? That's what happens every year." There's a slowdown that hits, and it happens, starts in May, and then June's when you really feel what I call the sift, shift, which we call, and we dub this, the summer shift, okay? It's going to happen every year. So pay attention to the dates, and if you want to get the most money, mid-January, end of April. If you're going to list in July, you can't get February, March pricing, okay? It's, real estate is a stock, sellers, you hear me? Real estate is a stock, you can't sit there and tell me, well, I wish I would have got X. Well, let me, this is what I tell people. When somebody says, well, I wish I would have got X price. I'm like, okay, well, you didn't sell at that time, right? It's the same thing I tell people now. It's like, I wish I would have bought Apple stock in the late 80s, okay? I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be sitting here doing this if I, if I bought you know, a bunch of Apple stock in the late 80s, but I can't do that. I can't get that price anymore. I have to pay today's price, and today's price is what you're going to get. So when you're thinking about prepping your property to sell in 2023, you got to make sure that you prep your property in time to get to the best market. Um, let's see here. Biggest reasons properties sit on the market price, you know, properties priced appropriately sell faster. Okay. Now I know what I would be thinking if I'm a seller. Well, anybody could sell at the right price. Well, technically, but not technically. Okay. Like, yeah, if you price this thing at a buck, it'll sell. But if the place is worth 350 and you price it at 450, it's not going to sell. Okay. I always tell people, like, I could get you a little bit more money. I could reach. I think I have good enough marketing. I think I'm a good enough negotiator. I think I know enough about the business. I could get you a little bit more money. But I can't get you something stupid. And people aren't idiots these days. Well, I'll take that back. People are idiots. But they're at least price sensitive, okay? So you could see if, if, if you have the same exact unit and your neighbor sells at 350 and you come on the market at 425 it's going to sit. Because guess what? John Smith's going to be like, yeah, I, I really like that one place. I keep seeing it, but it's at four and a quarter. And I saw the neighbor sold at 350. So those people are crazy. So I'm going to miss it. So main reason property sit price. Second main reason a property sits property doesn't show well, or there's something wrong with it, right? Like it's a weirdo layout. Uh, it's super unique or just, it just doesn't look good. Okay. And the third reason a property sit is that you hire the wrong person because if the property doesn't show well, uh, and it's priced high, that means you didn't hire somebody aggressive. I know for a fact, one of the main reasons I don't get business is I'm not full of shit. Um, I go on, I don't know, 10 to 11 listing appointments a week, minimum, minimum during busy season. And people are like, well, John Smith told me that I could get $500,000 for your place. I'm like, John Smith's an idiot. Okay. It's like easily only worth 300,000. I don't know where you're getting these pricings from it. And people will pass on me because they're like, you know, they want, a lot of people want to believe what they think is right, right? So like they, they think it's one thing and then there's some weaker broker out there who'll tell them what they want to hear and like, oh, okay, I'm going to go with that guy. But they get interviewed with three great brokers who all tell them the same thing, but they go with the one that's just like telling them lies. So like, you know, if you want your property to sit, you know, go with the pie in the sky person who's just making shit up. But if you want to sell the property, you got to hire somebody who knows what they're doing. I'm not saying, I'm not one of these idiots saying like, I'm the only good agent in the city. Okay, there's, there's, there's a lot of good guys I, I, and girls. There's a lot of good people out there. Um, I'm just saying that like, you know, you got to hire the right people and that can help move it faster. Uh, should sellers try the private network first? I think listening to the private network during the heart of busy season, if you got a pretty much run of the mill type of property, I think it's the dumbest thing you do. I know when I say this right now, people are going to go crazy. Okay. Cause I, most of the brokers that do the volume of business I do, they have a strategy. They go, uh, not that we don't have a strategy. They have a strategy in the sense that saying like, we're going in the privates first. Okay. And then if we don't sell, we're going to go on the active market. 
Here's why I think it's bad. Okay. Like I think the privates are really good right now. Okay. Because it's holiday season. There's not that many people out there. I don't want to waste market time today. So I'll go in the privates. Okay. And if somebody comes on the super serious, it's great. But after the first year, I'm going to go active. This is why I think privates is bad though, is because sales is a numbers game. I uh, sit there and do the research on Zenlist, top agent network, private MLS, all these things. You can look at the open ratio. So I look at when I post the property during busy season, most brokers are really busy. Okay. And I see that I'm only getting maybe about 30 to 35% of people opening up my private listings as posted. So think about this. I got 35% of people posting it. There's about a thousand brokers tops on tan, which means that we're hovering around maybe 300 brokers opening it, maybe. Okay. And out of those 300 brokers, maybe like 10 of them have clients. Okay. So now I'm really only appealing to about 10 agents. Now, listen, one of those 10 agents can very well have a buyer for it. And that's the theory that big agents will say. They'll be like, hey, these are super serious people. They're working with the cream of the crop. We're not getting anybody running through your property. Great. I got a $500,000 two-bed, two-bath condo in Lincoln Park. I want 5 billion people looking at my place. Because if I could sell before it hits the market to one of 10 people, don't you think the people who are just browsing on Zillow or Redfin or one of these other sites could possibly be a buyer? And you may have only gotten 505 in the pocket listing site, but maybe I could have got five and a quarter because we went on the active market because I got more people bidding. The more people who see it, the more opportunity I have to get more offers. The more offers I get, the higher price I have. During busy season with a hot run in the mill type property to not go on the active market, I think is doing you injustice. I tell, I tell those people right now, I will go on the privates in the first quarter for you all day long. It's in my best interest. Honestly, it's, I mean, it's great. Like I, I don't have to show it that much. I, I'll just do a quick block of showings. Be like, hey, private networks. Uh, we're going to do one showing Saturday between like two and three. And we'll call for highest and best at five. Okay. And that's it. We're done. Okay. Who's, I, I just, I always say like, who, who's, get, who's winning out on that? Whose best interest is at play? I do one block of showings. Now, if I go on that open market, I might have to do like six blocks of showings. Okay. But I'll get more money, you know? So that's just my opinion. I know what a lot of people think is they're saying like, well, you know, if you get a certain number, like how much more do you need to get, et cetera. I'm like, okay, well, you could do more than one block. You do two or three blocks. And then, you know, after that you could do it. But you know, you can't just do one day and one block and say, that's the best synopsis of what you're going to get. Now, if you do two or three blocks, you know, like a Wednesday, a Friday, and a Sunday, yeah, that's what you're going to, that's the best you're going to get out of those three. But at least give it more than one day. That's, that's more of my point on this. And that's why I think privates aren't the best situation. I realize how crazy people are going to go when I say this, because a lot of brokers think I'm the biggest idiot in the world because I don't think pockets are good during busy season. I tend to think I'm right. I do sell the most listings in the city of Chicago for I don't know how many more years in a row. I don't do as many high end uh, as a lot of people, uh, but we do our, we're up there. We're, we're in the top five for high end sales. So uh, I think I have a pretty good pulse on what works and what doesn't. And I'm not saying that there aren't certain strategies that you can take uh, for certain types of property where a pocket might be the good situation. But again, in a run in the mill, basic property during the heart of busy season, Going active on the active market, 9.9 .9 times out of 10 will net you more money. That's my thoughts. Um, what can sellers expect with finance and options for next year? I think rates are going down. I do. I think we peaked for a little bit. I, I think I think rates can be high fives, low sixes. I may say this in our 10% first of the year, and you guys are like, what an asshole. I can't completely predict the future, guys. I can predict a lot of stuff, but I can't predict the future of rates. I'm not sitting there watching like a hawk, but a lot of the stuff that I'm watching and indicating, I'm I think we're looking at high fives, low sixes. Now, that's not a great rate, right? Because at, at, at the start of last year, we were at 3%. But like, here's the other thing. Is that a lot of this stuff, like, let's say like Lincoln Bark single family homes. You, you, you had a home that came on the market, like 2 million that could bid up to like two and a quarter at the, you know, after the first of last year, that home, you might be able to get for like two, one today. It's $150,000 difference. So if you're paying an extra 3% on a rate, the, the, the payments are probably pretty much the same. So I think certain places like that, um, are going to benefit from the high rates. I think other places, I, I think the rate game is not going to be as crazy, like bad, meaning that like uh, people are going to have such a sour taste in their mouth after the first year because I think people are realizing like, hey, this is where it's at. I've said this a million times in podcasts, but average American interest rates were around six and a half percent. And the fact that we were at 3% before just shows you that like it's just not realistic or natural. Uh, but the fact is, is that like, 
you know, people are starting to realize like, hey, this is this is what it is. This is what I'm paying. This is what I'm going to get. So I, I think people are going to be doing less uh, rate buy downs and things of that nature uh, after the first. Um, do you expect uh, interest rates to fluctuate in 2023? Sure. I think they go up and down. Who knows? They could go up to 10. They go down to like four and a half. I don't know. You know, I, 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 I don't think they're going to get below 4% again. Where they're going to go throughout the whole year next year, I, I, I don't have a clue. I, I would suspect they're going to stay in like, you know, maybe if they did drop it like really low, maybe like high, high fours, like maybe. I, I think you're, we're mostly going to see fives and sixes. But again, I have no clue. I would have never thought at the start of last year that we get up to seven and a half at one point. I wouldn't have thought that. Um, I think I mentioned one of my podcasts, I thought they could get as high as six. Uh, and they went to seven and a half. So interest rates are, pff, there's a lot of other shit going behind the political scene that nobody can predict unless you're sitting in that room. It's like Alexander and Hamilton. You want to be in that room, right, where everything happens. Well, I'm not in that room where everything happens, uh, nor do I know anybody that's in that room where everything happens. So until I am, uh, maybe someday. Uh, I can't tell you where exactly the rates are going to go, but I think they're going to remain higher than they were for the first part of 2022. How long does the listing process take? Depends on what kind of team you got. We got this thing down like a well-oiled machine. We got people in place for everything to make sure this hands out goes great. I could technically be on the market within 40 hours. I can meet you right now, have my people there tomorrow, and be live the day after that. That's how quick we can move. Now, of course, if you got shit all over the place and the place has got to be painted and all this other stuff, maybe we can't move that quick. But I would say the longest it takes us to get a property in the market, even if you got to do some work, is a week. Uh, but it shouldn't take you any more than two to three days for the place ready to go. I mean, it, it, there's technology, guys. Like, and if you got good systems in place, you got the right people. Like for us, I got somebody who does all the listening paperwork. I got somebody who walks the property. I got somebody that once we prep the property to go live, once we go live, we get put in the system and we do all the feedback stuff. So we got everything like ready to go. Um, what do you expect from your listing realtor? I, I think your listing realtor at a bare minimum should be taking some professional pictures. I'll tell you that. There's still a lot of listings out there online that are done with their iPhone, but I think you should work with somebody uh, that knows the process very well and knows the business very well. And I think this is why a lot of realtors are going to fail next year. And I'm loving the fact that the market's going to be quote unquote, a little bit more difficult next year. And a lot of people are freaking out. I'm, I'm personally, I think I'm going to have the best year ever next year. I had the best 2022 is going to go down as the best year of my entire career. 2023 is going to go down as my next best year of my career. And let me tell you why, because sellers, you guys out there watching this are going to interview harder. Okay. And there's been about, I don't know, four to 5,000 new agents that enter the downtown markets that have never been through a buyer's market. In fact, Joey Zimmerman, shout out to Joey Zimmerman. I was at a coffee talk with him with about 50 of the other top brokers. He said that 84% of brokers that have their license currently today have never experienced a buyer's market. Think about that. 84% of brokers today have never experienced a buyer's market. So that means they've never been in a market where it's been bad. That is insane. I've been through the Great Recession. You know, I've, I've you know, was helping my dad sell in 2001 when the market wasn't that great. I've seen all this shit happen. Okay. I, I know what you have to do. Sellers are going to interview harder. They're going to make sure they're using the latest technology. They're going to make sure that you're being consistent. They're going to make sure you're getting feedback. They're going to be sure you're making do all this stuff. There was, there was something interesting that I, when I was at this event that people kept saying, they said they had got to go back to the basics. Like people got to go back to the basics. I think a lot of sellers are going to be talking to uh, agents who are actually doing your basic stuff. Now, me personally, I, and I said this, I, I've never lost sight of the basics. I think the basics are, are how you have to do it. I mean, if you're running a, a well-oiled machine and you have, a, you know, in my opinion, one of the best products that there is out there, I never forget about the basics. I'm fired up today because my team dropped the ball on a basic earlier today and I wanted to kill people. I don't allow mistakes to happen. I'm not saying we don't make mistakes, but it's very rare we do make one. And when we make it, not only do we make up for it, but we make sure it doesn't happen again because you have to always be on your, your game and make sure that you don't drop the ball. And by doing that, you're going to win next year. So when you're thinking about what type of agent am I going to hire, you got to make sure that those people not only are doing the basics, which is just follow up showing and not missing showings, but going above and beyond and using the latest technology, trying to think outside the box to sell your property. It's going to be a little bit more difficult to sell the properties in the outskirts next year. Guess what? I've been selling Hi, uh, hard properties for the last three years. 60% of our sales is in the heart of the downtown and high rises. Who the fuck wanted to buy a downtown condo in 2020 right after riots happened and nobody was going back to the office? Tell me what was harder to sell 
That's what I tell people. But people are like, well, you know, it's been easy. What's been easy? What's been easy when the when you had to walk past a broken window in the lobby to get up to the unit and there's nobody in the building and it feels like a ghost town and only one of you could get on the elevator at a time and then I have to meet you upstairs because they won't let two people go on the elevator and then go show a unit. What's going to be harder than that? You tell me. So when all these brokers are now, it's like, oh, it's about to get difficult. <laughs> get difficult. This is going to be a walk in the park compared to 2020 and 21. This is going to be easy. Everybody out there just was, you know, they were too weak or too afraid to work during the heart of the pandemic. I was out there on the front lines like Pat making sure that we get it. We did it and we won. So when I look at 2023 and I think to myself, oh, this is going to be a difficult market. I'm like, it's going to be an easy market. And when you think about who to hire, you got to think to yourself, I want to hire a winner who's not going to think about failure. We're only going to think about winning. And that's it. What are the steps of the listing process? We'll talk about that. Are there listing, are sales price estimates online a good indication of what your property is worth? No. They're, it's a pretty much general ballpark algorithm. In fact, they're getting rid of these on all these sites because they're so far off. They're stupid. I, I, I've talked about this a million times. They take a, an average weight in the zip code. You can have two properties on Lakeshore Drive that are two bedrooms, two baths, 1,200 square feet. One faces a brick wall and is in original condition, and one is completely remodeled and looks at the lake. And they say the one that faces the brick wall, the zestimate is worth more than the one facing the lake. It doesn't make any sense, guys. Their algorithm is off. They're getting rid of these because of that. You know, you could, can you say like, hey, it's worth somewhere around this number they post? Sure. I think, I think it's like one of those things where it's like, you know, maybe the place is worth, you know, 500 and they got the zestimate five and a quarter. Like, I think it's sometimes within like 25 to 30,000. I think you use as a ballpark indicator of like, it's probably around somewhere in the vicinity of this number, but like, you know, nail down price. No. Um, do you think days in the market will go up or down next year for new listings? They're definitely gonna go up. I mean, the heart of the city, well, let, let me put it this way, two different markets outskirts. The market time was crazy. I mean, during the heart of busy season, it was less than 30 days. Okay. I think it's going to be higher during the heart of the busy season. I'm going to think it's gonna be around like maybe about 45 ish days on the outskirts for properties, like, you know, your general run-of-the-mill properties. There's still going to be hot properties going to sell, first day in the market, multiple bids, et cetera. I think overall, though, because there's going to be a lot of bad properties or overpriced and stuff like that, which way down uh, the average market time. I, I think we'll probably see around a 45-day uh, average market time on the outskirts. I think the heart of the city, though, is probably going to drop to more like a 90 days. You know, at, at one point, the uh, heart of the city got up to 184 days on the market. Uh, as an average, 184. Think about that. So again, when people tell me like, oh, 2023 is going to be a difficult year, it's like, fuck, man, 184 days. You're telling me, I tell this to brokers in certain cities. to like, what's the average mark time in some parts of your market? Like 184 days. Like, I'm sorry, what? I'm like, yes, yeah, we have properties that have been on the market for 184 days. You know, they're like, what? I have properties right now that have been on the market for like two years. You know, guess what? I just closed on one yesterday that had the market for two and a half years. Didn't show up for a while. Got one person that walked in there, bought it. It was right on Michigan Avenue. Before Michigan Avenue was one of the hot, like a couple years back, pre-pandemic, like if you had a place on Michigan Avenue and you were out of state, like you'd go to a dinner party. This is what Michigan Avenue used to be. Like you go to a dinner party, you'd like, oh, like, where do you live? They're like, I live in this suburb, you know, and they're like Colorado. They're like, and I got a, I got a second home on uh, Michigan Avenue. And people are like, oh shit, that, that guy, you know, that guy does what, you know, that, you know, John that we just met and that guy's got a place on Michigan Avenue. People are like, it's really nice. Right. Then during the pandemic, people are like, oh, I got a place on Michigan Avenue. Like, oh, yuck. That's disgusting. Ugh, I can't believe you got to put uh, 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 not for me. Now, starting to kind of come back a little bit more. Now we're starting to see these people kind of come back and be like, yeah, I kind of want a place that's close to Michigan Avenue so I can tell my buddies. And now we got people who are starting to think it's cool again. Guys, a lot of times real estate's like a Louis Vuitton bag. I hate to put it like that. I don't care what anybody tells me it is. It's like all of a sudden something gets cool, people want it again, right? It's like the West Loop. Look at the West Loop too, right? West Loop wasn't cool for the last three years. Market took a like, nosedive there. Now it's starting to get kind of cool again. Cool companies are coming back. People think it's cool. Cool restaurants are coming back. People are going to restaurants again. Remember, people weren't going to restaurants. So, like, you know, you have to think of all this stuff affects the marketplace. This is why I talk about, like, how do I predict the market? How do I think about what's happening in the market? I look at everything. I see what's happening in people's brains. I'm, ha I'm looking at what's happening with people, you know, in retail sector. What's happening with, like, what the trends are going on across the country. What's going on in the stock market. What's going on in wars across the world. You know, what types of things are affecting Everything that affects one thing has a domino effect to affect everything else. So you have to take all this stuff into factors when you're looking at where do we think this market's going to go. Um, is Chicago pricing expected to plummet? No, stop being dramatic. Anybody who tells me that, I'm like, I just, I, it, it's, it's like a flip. What do they use the word trigger? Trigger? Is that the, the cool word? Triggers? Triggers me. That triggers me when somebody says the Chicago market will plummet. I'm like, fuck it. 
God, I have the same conversation. Think about this, guys. Like, I have the same conversation like 15 times a day, seven days a week, okay? So if I just had like lost two deals, okay, and then, I don't know, somebody yells at me, and then, I don't know, my wife calls me, the baby's crying, so I'm going to have a nervous breakdown, and then somebody else calls me and is like, ah, I heard prices are going to plummet. Like, I got to tell you, I could see why some people may not think I'm the nicest person in the world because I'm just like, this is stu- this is like, just don't. Just stop. Stop. Because like, you know, that the, the 10 time, and, and usually this is like 10.30 at night, so I get it out there. Somebody's like, well, you shouldn't just pick up your phone at that time. Like, I, I'm crazy, so I'm still going to answer the phone. But like, the prices are going to plummet. Everybody's got to stop being so dramatic. Our prices didn't go up that much, guys, okay? In fact, in the heart of the city, it went down as much as 30% in some buildings. On the outskirts, like, you know, some areas went up like maybe 10 to 12% in the past couple of years. So we went up like 3 to 5% a year, okay? <laughs> tell, tell somebody in Florida that they went up 5% a year. Tell them what that means. They'd be laughing in your face. Be like, we went up 5% in the last day. Like, just sitting here, my property went up 5%, just in this conversation. So, like, plummet. How are we going to plummet? If something went down 20%, you think it's going to go down another 20%? So you think a place can be worth 40% less since 2020? It doesn't make any sense. It's just a dumb conversation. We, we've, we've, we've talked about this in the last three podcasts. If you're curious about that, watch the last ones, but it's not going to plummet. Are there any major developments that will impact sales like the new Concedo or moving the Bears Stadium? I mean, I don't know. I mean, the Bally's Casino people are up in arms against. Now, I don't know. A lot of my younger clients think it's really cool. I'm against it. I've been on record. I think it's stupid. I hope it didn't happen, but it's happening. So guess what? I get bitch and moan about it and say, uh, boo-hoo, it's happening right down the street and cry and complain. Or you'd be like, listen, it's life. Okay. You can't always get what you want. And other people like it. I'm happy for them. Let's just make the best of what we got. Okay. Let's make lemonade out of the lemons we got. But you know, at the end of the day, like there's nothing crazy that's going to come into the city right now. that's going to help us. And there's nothing crazy that's happening that can go. I mean, like, honestly, if the beers move out of Soldier Field, like a lot of people like South Loop's going to plummet. I mean, like, Maybe I sell like one property a year to somebody's like, I got to, you know, buy down here because the beers play here. Like nobody's going to care. Something else is going to go there. They're going to figure out something else to do with it. Soldier Field is a great place in general. If you don't like Soldier Field, like maybe because the beers play there, do some research on why it actually exists and you'll be pumped up about it again. The reality is like there's nothing crazy that's happening. Best advice for home sellers in 2023. Uh, Price it correctly. Don't just look at the uh, beginning of what thing... I think if you look at pricing from the beginning part of 2022 in certain sectors of the market, you're going to do yourself an injustice. You're going to overprice your place. I think you have to look at the trends for the last like three years and do a weighted average for how you're going to price your place. Make sure that your property shows well because you're going to have more competition than you did last year. You're not going to be the only uh, person on the block and you got to make sure you hire right. That's it, guys. Hopefully this advice helps you lead to a successful sale in 2023. I'm Matt Laracy, and thanks for listening to Laracy Live.